Dear students, welcome to the last video of the BIS chapter. In this video, we are going to continue our discussion about the problems and the solution of BIS. First, we will talk about the full coverage problem, followed by test lens problem, unknown problem, diagnosis, power, etc. problems. Finally, we will conclude the BIS chapter. We already know how to solve alpha seed from our video 13.3. For example, given this polynomial f0, which is x to the fourth plus x cubed plus 1, suppose we want to detect this stuck at 0, 4. So we will need s9 to be 1, s8, and s5 to be 1. We can write this linear equation system where q0 is 1, q1 is 1, and uh, q3 is 0. So we can have four variables in this system and three equations. We can easily find a solution which is 0, don't care, 1, 1. So we solve the seed successfully. Now, suppose we want to detect another 4, where S8 is 1, S5 and S4 are 1. So we can write this linear equation system, where Q1 is 1, and the Q1 exclusive or Q0 is 1. But now, for S4, we have a conflict based on the previous two equation, this value should be 0, but now we want a 1. So we fail to find a solution. This is what we call linear dependency problem. We cannot find a solution due to the conflict of linear equations. So what can we do to detect the 4? A simple idea is that we can change the polynomial. Now, suppose we change this polynomial to f1, which is another primitive polynomial, x to the fourth plus x plus 1. Given the same fault, now we can successfully find a solution where q1 is 1, and q0 is 0, and q2 is 0. So, we can now find a seed successfully. So does it mean f1 is better than f0? Maybe not. Now it's time for you to work on the quiz. Please show that the new polynomial f1 cannot generate the original test pattern. Now please pause the video and work on this quiz. OK, have you finished it? It should be easy. According to this test cube, S9 is 1, S8 is 1, and now S5 should be 0, but we need a 1. So again, we have a conflict. So our original polynomial F0 successfully generate test pattern T0 but it cannot generate T1. On the contrary, a new polynomial F1 successfully generate T1, but it cannot generate T0. So how can we generate both test patterns T0 and T1? The solution is quite simple. We can use both polynomials to generate two different test patterns. This is called multiple polynomial LVSR proposed by Helen Brand in 1992. Consider this multiple polynomial FSR. We have two different feedback. One is for polynomial F0. We can generate test pattern T0. If we select this feedback point, then we have another polynomial F1, which generates test pattern T1. So using this multiple polynomial of SR, we can generate both test patterns for these 
two different faults. So multiple polynomial LFSR successfully improves the fault coverage by using a little bit more area overhead. Now let's look at the third problem that causes best fault coverage loss, the random pattern resistant fault. Random pattern resistant faults or RPRF are those faults that are very difficult to be detected by random patterns. They are also known as difficult faults or hard to detect faults. A simple example of RPRF is an uninput and gate output stuck at zero fault. For example, given this five input and gate to detect the output stuck at zero fault, we will require five ones at the input. The probability of generating five ones by random pattern is one half to the power of five. If we have an input, the probability of detecting the output stuck at zero four is a half to the power of n, which is very low when n is large. So we have many solutions to detect the random pattern resistant force in BIST. First, we can try multiple polynomial LFSR. If it doesn't work, we have other solutions such as top-up ADBG pattern, weighted random pattern, mapping logic, and uh, finally, we can try to insert test points. This has been covered in the DFT chapter. So we will not talk about test point again here. First, let's try if multiple polynomial FSR can help. Suppose we want to detect the output stuck at 0 for, for this 5 input and gate. This is a random pattern resistance for. So we will require 5 ones at the scan chain. We use polynomial F0 and uh, we found no solution. And again we tried another polynomial F1 which has no solution either. Unfortunately in this case we failed to find a solution even using two polynomials. This is because we have too many specified bits for this random pattern resistance ball. So what can we do? The next solution, we can use top-up ATPG patterns. This is also known as mixed mode BIST, which mix the bits with traditional ATPG. First, we run BIST to detect the easy to detect faults, and then we stop BIST and uh, load top-up patterns from ATE to detect the remaining hard to detect fault. As is shown in this figure, first we run the BIST to a certain point, and then we run ATPG to achieve a even better fault coverage. As shown in the right figure, if we use only the BIST solution, the fault coverage may not be good enough and the test length is very long. However, if we download the deterministic ATPG pattern, then we can achieve a very high fault coverage in a very short test length. So, the mixed mode BIST is actually a very good compromise solution that achieves high fault coverage at the cost of a little bit ATE memory. And the third solution is weighted random pattern which has been proposed by Sherman in 1975. This technique simply adds a small weighting logic to bias the probability of zeros and ones. For example, in this picture the original pseudo-random patterns coming out from the LFSR have almost a half probability of 1 
and almost a half probability of zeros. After the weighting logic, the output are weighted random patterns. For example, the output coming out from these three input and gate. The probability of 1 is 1 over 8. The probability of 0 is 7 over 8. We can see that the probability of 0 is much larger than the probability of 1. Similarly, for these three input or gate, the output weighted random pattern has 7 eighth probability of 1. If we apply this pattern to generate 5 ones, the probability is 7 over a to the power of 5, which is much much larger than the probability of 1 half to the power of 5. By using the weighted random patterns, we have much higher probability of detecting random pattern resistant force. The fourth solution use extra logic to change the pattern. There are mapping logic proposed by Tuba in 1995 or bit flipping technique proposed by Wanderlich in 1996. These two techniques has very similar idea. They insert a small logic that convert the original LFSA pattern to our desired test patterns. For example, suppose the original pattern coming from LFSA is 01111, but we want all five ones. So we can have a small mapping logic that change this 0 to 1. Similarly, for a sequential circuit, suppose the bit string coming out from the LFSR is 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. We can have a simple bit flipping function that flip the last bit so we can have 5 ones going into our CUT. So the idea of these two techniques try to use very small area overhead to maximize the for coverage. Now it's time for a small quiz. Suppose we have two mapping logic to generate our desired test pattern 11111. Mapping logic number one and mapping logic number two. So which one is better? This is a simple quiz. Have you got it? We want to minimize the area of mapping logic. So if we concern about the area, of course, the inverter has much smaller area. So mapping logic 2 is the winner. Now we have finished all the discussion about this fork coverage problem. We have a summary here. In the last video, we talked about the structure dependency problem. The reason for the fault coverage loss is due to LVSR phase shift among two neighbor channels. In this video, we talk about linear dependency problem. The reason is different. The reason for linear dependency problem is due to the LVSR feedback polynomials. Also, we talk about random pattern resistant fault, which require many specified bits to detect a fault. For the structural dependency problem, the location of specified bits is located among different scan chains. For linear dependency problem, the specified bits are typically in the same scan chain. For random pattern resistant fault, the location of specified bit can be different or the same scan chain. To solve the structure dependency problem, we introduced phase shifter in the previous video. Of course, there are some other solutions available. Also, in this video, 
we introduced multiple polynomial FSR to solve a linear dependency problem. And we also introduced top up ADPG weighted random mapping logic test point insertion to solve the random pattern resistance fault. In conclusion, there are many techniques available to improve the base fault coverage. Next, we will discuss the long test length problem. It is well known that this typically requires more pattern than traditional ATPG because these patterns are pseudo-random, not deterministic. For example, given this LFSR, which generate 15 different patterns in this cycle, Suppose that we want three patterns, 1-0-0-0, and 1-1-0-1. We only need these three test patterns. However, if we start our beast from the seed, 1-0-0-0, we will need to run nine cycles. Many of them are useless patterns. So can we shorten the base test length? Of course, we can use previous techniques such as multiple polynomial FSR, top-up ATPG, or mapping logic, etc. Here we will introduce a new concept, receding. The idea of receding has been proposed by Kuhnemann in 1991. The idea is that we can download new seed to improve the base coverage in a short time. The procedure to run receding is we download a seed and we execute n cycles and then we repeat to download a new seed. For example, for the same LFSR, starting from the initial seed, 1, 0, 0, 0, we run two cycles, and then we recede to 1, 0, 0, 1. Again, we run two cycles. In this way, we only need four cycles compared with previous techniques we can save a lot of test time. This figure shows the concept of receding. Suppose we only use one single seed. The fall coverage increases very slowly along with time. However, if we can use the concept of receding, we can try to recede and the fault coverage will improve much more faster than a single seed piece. In this way, we can shorten our test length. Next, let's see the unknown output response problem, or also known as X. There are many different sources of a known CUT output in bit mode. First, we can have tri-state bus contention or memory or undriven dangling input or initialized non-scan free flop or combinational logic loop and many other possible source of unknowns. Now we have an FFT for you. So why do we need to avoid the unknown output in the beast? This is a good question to think about. Anyway, if we want to avoid X, we have several solutions. First, control point insertion. This has also been introduced in the DFT chapter. We can also use memory wrapper. We can also insert masking logic. First, the control point insertion 
has been introduced in our video 11.7. Given this original design with a tri-state bus driven by three drivers, this design can have a known if we have more than one driver driving different values. To avoid this problem, we can insert additional DFT logic so that when scan enable is equal to 1, there is only one driver D1 driving the bus. So we can avoid tri-state bus contention. We also insert this bus keeper. So the bus will not be floating. In this way, we can avoid a known output coming out from the bus. Another source of a known output is coming from memory. In test mode, memory are typically uninitialized, so we don't know what is the contents in the memory. The inputs are actually unobservable and the memory output are uncontrollable. So what should we do? A simple solution is that we can add wrapper around the memory as shown in the gray area. We can observe the memory input. We capture them into scan free file. When test mode is one, this will be sent out to the memory output and the memory X will be blocked. In this way, we can bypass memory in test mode. And the third solution is we can mask a nonce coming out from CUT using mapping logic. As is shown in this figure, we insert the mapping logic before the miser. And we have a controller that generates control signal. When we have a known coming out from the CUT, we can mask the unknown using a simple logic such as an end gate. When the control signal is zero, we can mask the unknown so that a zero is coming into the miser. Now let's have a look at the diagnosis problem in BISMO. Diagnosis or debug is typically very difficult in BISMO because we don't have direct observation of the CUT output. So we don't know where are the failing patterns and what are the failing outputs. Typically people can use something like a binary search procedure to find the failing pattern. First, we run the bits and we pause at a specified pattern. We unload the signature. If the signature is correct, we can double the pattern counter. If the signature is wrong, we want to have the pattern counter. This procedure is repeated until we have found one failing pattern. For example, in this figure, the blue bar shows the bit test lens. We have 1000 test pattern. And the yellow slots shows the failing pattern. So initially, we run all the 1000 pattern and we download the signature. The signature is wrong. So we would have our pattern. We run the test to 500 pattern. Still, the signature is wrong. And then we would run the base to 250 pattern. This process is repeated until we find the failing pattern. And we run the best until this first failing pattern. And then 
we unload the scan output directly without miser so we can observe the failing output diagnosis in beast mode have two major problems the first is that we need a lot of pre-computed intermediate signature and this require a long computation time the second is that the performance of this procedure is very time consuming because we want to repeat this process again and again finally let's look at the high test power problem of BIST it is well known that BIST consume a lot of test power because of the high test frequency it's according to an industry estimation the BIST power can be two times or even ten times higher than normal operation mode so there are many solutions available to reduce the BIST power for example we can lower the clock frequency or we can lower the test voltage or we can reject those high power test patterns finally we can use special low power DFT such as taco suppression technique as is shown in this figure in this DFT we have an extra NOR gate inserted between the scan free flop and the logic when scan enable is 1 the data output is tied to logic 0 so that there is no toggle when the scan chain is shifting in this way we can reduce the test power actually there are many other low power techniques to reduce the test power but we will not discuss them in detail in this video finally we will conclude the base chapter this has many good advantages such as we can have less expensive tester with BIST because the tester can have less pattern storage and the less pin also slower speed the second advantage is that we can run BIST at specified speed this is very important for BIST the third advantage is easier integration of tests this is particularly important for system on chip SOC testing because in SOC there are many intellectual property IP coming from different vendors and we don't know how to test them if we can have BIST then the test problem can be solved easily the fourth advantage is that we can have easier access to embedded blocks or cores for example if we want to test embedded memory we will need BIST otherwise we don't have so many pins to test the memory and eventually BIST enables online testing with so many advantage this is a very popular test technique in spite of the advantage this still has some problems this slide shows some myths about this first of all this is not a replacement for scan actually this is built on top of scan and the this also requires many test points second this does not remove the need for testers actually testers are still needed to initiate the test to apply top part ADPT patterns and etc and thirdly this does not necessarily reduce test time because typically this requires a lot of test patterns 
So this does not necessarily reduce the overall test cost. To give you a better understanding, we will show real base cases from this paper. These numbers are real base cases from Texas Instrument and the Mentor Graphic Chips. We have four ASIC chips in this experiment. This slide shows the gate count and the number of scan cells in this design. We can see that we need to insert control points and observation point for best design. And the best area overhead is around 1%. These two rows shows their CPU runtime of the tool. And this slide compare the best result and the ATPG result. From these two rows, we can see the best pattern count and the ATPG pattern count. We can see that typically, best pattern count is much more than ATPG pattern count. And these two rows compare the best single stock at four coverage and the ATPG single stock at four coverage. We can see that ATPG coverage is typically higher than the base for coverage. In terms of test frequency, we can see that base frequency is higher because we can apply the test at normal functional speed. Overall speaking, the base test time are still slightly higher because of the long test pattern count. In terms of ATE memory, this does not require any ATE memory. And the ATPG requires a large memory volume. So in summary, in this chapter, we have shown some problems associated with BIST. First of all, BIST coverage is typically low, so we have many solutions to improve the coverage. And the BIST test length is typically very long, so we introduce the receding concept. And we have to be careful about unknown output responses. So we showed control point, memory ripper, and the masking logic to deal with a known output. We also need binary search to help us to diagnose in this mode. And the base power is very high. So we can either reduce the frequency or reduce the voltage or use low power DFT to solve the power problem. Finally, we have an FFT for you. In the past, we, we were not worried about a known output in the traditional ATE and the ATPG. However, in this lecture, we were worried about a known output coming out from the beast. So what is the reason we care about a known output in BIST. This figure provides you a good hint. Please think about it. Thank you.